thank you. It's great to be here. Um, today I'm going to tell you about the maximum likelihood loss, or as I like to call it, the NLP Swiss knife. Uh, and I will show you how it can be applied to address many different problems in text generation models. So if you ever dealt with a text generation model, you know they sometimes tend to have issues. Even now, in the era of GPT-3 and such, text generation models can still exhibit problematic behavior, such as generating repetitions, logical flaws, toxic bias, uh, or just a uh, flat and uninteresting response. So let's look at a few examples. Here's a snippet from GPT-3 just from last week, uh, when the model shows probably toxic speech uh, when given a prompt about Jews. An example from contradictions, here is from GPT-2, an older model. Uh, when the model is given the context, I love basketball, it's really awesome, I really dislike, and still assigns a high probability to the word basketball as the next token, even though it contradicts the context it was given. Another example from GPTJ, this one I took from Reddit. Uh, the model was prompted to speak like Gandalf, but it couldn't quite stick to character, and when asked what's the color of your head, it says white. Finally, an example for repetitions. This is from uh, BlenderBot, a state-of-the-art open-source conversational model. Uh, when the model asks the, asks the user, uh, do you have any hobbies? And then the user responds. And then the bot asks, uh, what do you like to do in your free time? Which is essentially the same question over again. So why does it happen? There are several reasons. The first reason, as always, has to do with the data. So text generation models were pre-trained on data from the internet, and as we all know, data in the internet can be problematic, can contain bias and different toxic speech. Uh, in addition, if I have a small data set, uh, even the slightest imbalance on, or overexpression uh, can lead to major degradations in the model um, that, learned, that was learned from that. Uh, another second reason uh, has to do with the way uh, these models are trained. So the way te text generation models are optimized is they're given a context, like yesterday I went to D, and they learn to predict the next word. So it can be gym, mall, or a women in data science conference in our case. Um, and this is the only thing they're optimized for, for maximizing the probability of the next word. They're not explicitly optimized to avoid repetitions or to be logically consistent or to avoid bias. So it's no wonder this stuff uh, find their way into our models. Uh, the problem is that real natural language, human language, doesn't optimize for probability. Uh, it was actually shown that the next words that we say are often unexpected, you know, just to keep things interesting. So what this creates is a discrepancy between the text, the data, that the model seen on training, uh, and the text that generates during inference time, uh, which becomes even more and more uh, problematic as the, text, as the generated text becomes longer and more dependent on the model context. And the third reason is um, especially prominent in open-ended setups like uh, dialogue, when there are many multiple possible responses for a, for a certain context. Uh, and it's that the model kind of converges into an average representation, which might fit many contexts, uh, but it's a bit too general. So if we look at a few examples here, these are two conversations about hobbies. And the first one, the user says, I like playing tennis. And the, then the bot says, oh, me too, who's your favorite player? Mine is Federer. Uh, in the second example, the user says they play the piano, and the bot says, oh, that's so cool, what age did you start? So these are both two examples for good, interesting responses that stay on topic. However, uh, learning on many examples of this kind can lead the model to converge to a general representation, general response, um, such as this one, oh, that's great, what do you like most about it? which in okay, it is an okay response for this context, uh, but it is kind of boring. So at Lura, we encounter this problem pretty often. Uh, we develop an AI-based English teacher, which helps people improve their English through conversation. Uh, the thing is, currently, people that reach a certain uh, basic level of English, um, they're a bit stuck because they need to practice. And of course, you can't get really good at a language without practicing it. Uh, but currently, the only way to practice is with human teachers. Uh, and this can be a bit cumbersome because it's uh, time consuming and expensive and can be a bit embarrassing for some people. Uh, so we propose a solution for that. We have this app that people can download and speak to about any subject. And during the conversation, they will get feedback about the grammar, fluency, pronunciation, uh, and so on. Uh, and this is done in a safe environment without judgment because, of course, you're speaking to a bot. Um, and on your free time, even for five minutes every day. And uh, it's, of course, much more affordable uh, than human teachers. So at the core of this uh, product, we have this dialogue agent, which is essentially a text generation model. 
and it also had different issues. So one issue is that we encountered uh, is the issue of persona inconsistency. So as a text generation app, uh, we want our model to be able to have a consistent persona. What do I mean by persona? It's a set of uh, certain personality characteristics that we want our model to always adhere to. For example, uh, when asked, what is your name? We want it to always say, my name is Lura. And when asked, what do you do for a living? We want it to always say, it's an English teacher, uh, and so on. And however, uh, when you take a pre-trained generative model, generative model that wasn't explicitly optimized for this task, then of course, it won't be able to produce these responses. Uh, and you get persona inconsistency. Here, for example, when asked, uh, what is your name? It will say, my name is Jonathan, or something else. Uh, and if one asks what you do for a living, to say I work as a hospital, at a hospital as a nurse, or I'm a freelance writer, and so on. And this is, of course, less than ideal because we want our users to have a, a coherent experience uh, with the chatbot. Um, so what can we do to improve, to address this problem and to improve uh, different other problems? Um, here, maximum likelihood comes into the picture. So, hold on a second. Yeah, so maximum likelihood is a general framework. Uh, that can be applied to many different uh, kind of problems. Uh, so this is how it works. Uh, first, during training, in addition to generating just the next token, uh, you step and you generate a whole sequence token by token in an autoregressive way. Then you look at the sequence and you check if it contains some sort of a problem according to your definition of a problem. And if it does, you identify the specific tokens in the sequence that contribute to this problem. And uh, once you have the sequence, the token, you can penalize them directly by minimizing their likelihood, essentially by just by adding the probability to the loss. So eventually what you get is a combined objective of the standard maximum likelihood training of predicting the gold next token and uh, the unlikelihood loss contain, uh, controlled by some alpha factor, uh, which penalizes for unwanted behavior. So let's look at a couple of examples. Say we want to uh, minimize gender bias in our models. This is a work done by Facebook. Um, so what they did, they identified tokens that were overexpressed uh, with regards to some gender, and then they penalized them directly. And how did they find them? So they conducted many conversations of a chatbot with itself, um, conditioned on a name, because in English it's mostly easy to deduce the gender based on the name. Uh, and then they have a lot of conversation and then calculated for every token in the vocabulary, its overexpression ratio, meaning how much it was used in the context of specific gender versus its usage on the whole corpus. Uh, and then when they have this, they had this vocabulary, uh, they trained the, the model and during training, they stopped, they generated the sequences and for every token in the sequence, they penalized it according to the ratio of the gender overexpression of this uh, token, uh, thus making the model more balanced. Uh, and back to our problem of persona contradictions. So say the persona we want to optimize for is, my name is Laura, I'm an English teacher, and I live in California. Uh, and say that the bot context, that we, the context to the model that we get is, hi, how are you? Great, what did you do today? Uh, so I'm stopping and I'm generating a whole response for that. And I'm getting, uh, I had a long shift at the hospital, how about you? Which is, of course, contrary to my English teaching persona. So I can identify the contradiction, and there are multiple ways of doing that. For example, using an NLI model, which is able to identify contradictions, or by using classifier for that, or whatever. Uh, and once I have this sequence, uh, I can either use the whole tokens for the penalty, or I can use the specific tokens that contain the contradictions uh, by more complex methods, such as a gradient attribution. Uh, but anyway, I can use those tokens and penalize them directly. And we actually saw it worked. I mean, it really helped us reduce the number of contradictions in our model. So to sum it up, uh, text generation models tend to have different kinds of issues, uh, but the unlikelihood loss can help solve some of them. So the next time you have trouble with your text generation model, uh, you're welcome to try that. It might help. Thank you. <laughs>